Hi, everyone. Um, just checking in for the last one uh, of 2019. That's a crazy thought. Um, I got some uh, positive feedback, better camera work last night. The acoustics were a bit better. Uh, some people very disappointed, though, because the dog wasn't following me around yesterday. You, you can't please everyone, right? Uh, so I've got a couple of things to go through this evening. Um, a couple of people have requested some things from the Triple Award. Uh, I'm going to do uh, an extended bit on conduction, convection, and radiation, and insulations, because that's bound to come up. It's going to come up somewhere. Uh, how they ask those questions, I don't know. Sorry, I'm just making sure I've got my book ready. Um, so, yeah, we're going to get something on energy transfers. We'll, we'll get something on circuits. It's always there. Uh, we'll probably get something on power stations as well. So um, we'll see. We'll, we'll just work through some stuff tonight, and then I'll see some of you guys tomorrow morning uh, in assembly uh, for one last effort to, to cram some physics, get you thinking, and then... Um, yeah, then it's it's game time. We'll uh, we'll smash it. It's going to be great. Okay, so um, should we do some basics first? Remember, guys, if you want uh, me to go through anything in particular, I would like you to just you know chuck them in the comments on the side, um, and I'll I'll do my best. So it's nice to see so many of you here. I think you guys are really getting into this now. The year 11s, um, I think they they caught up with it a bit late. You guys. Um, <laughs> um, I think you guys are doing this really well. I think it's great to see so many of you here making the effort. I don't know about you, but I'm absolutely exhausted. Um, I had a, don't worry though, I had like a 10 minute power nap in front of the TV a moment ago. House has gone quiet, so um, let's do some physics. Um, so, so some of the stuff that we've been doing. Okay, you recognize this one, nice and quick. Let's get it in our heads. This is the national grid. We're gonna start from here and then talk about power stations. So power stations at the beginning of the national grid, we've got step-up transformers, the transmission lines. These are about half a million volts, 500 kilovolts. This is a nice chance to talk about this. So kilovolts, that's a 1,000 volts. Megavolts, or uh, that's millions of volts. Um, so watch out for those. Um, sometimes they expect you to change units, so just be careful with that. Transmission lines, step-down transformer, consumers at the end. You're the consumer, remember. Power stations, transmission, consumers. The national grid is a whole mix of this stuff here. Um, lots of different power stations all working together to make sure there's a constant supply of energy meeting your needs. If you guys um, demand more electricity, then the national grid does its best to provide that by um, switching on other power stations. Um, if the weather changes and they, they have to adjust the energy balance, then they, they mix those around. So the, the national grid are monitoring as well as distributing the power, and they are everywhere. There are power stations across the UK, power lines that connect all of that stuff to you guys uh, for use. Right, so while we're on power stations, let's talk about some of the power stations that you're likely to be asked about. Um, in Wales, there's a big thing about hydroelectric power because we have uh, quite a few here. Uh, they're mostly something called pump storage. That's where we store water deliberately at the top of uh, the mountain. And then once the um, once there's a high demand for that electricity, the operator of the power station will open the gates. They can send water down really fast and generate electricity from that. So it's turning kinetic or gravitational potential into kinetic and then into electrical energy. Um, hydroelectric power stations like Denorwig um, take have a really short startup time. They're fantastic for solving short-term demand. Um, yes, I can do parallel circuits for you, it's not a problem, Grace. Uh, we can do some ammeters and stuff as well. Uh, other power stations that are important like to come up, wind turbines. Wind turbines are brilliant because they release uh, no carbon dioxide when they are working, although there is some carbon dioxide in their manufacture and their installation. They are relatively cheap to, to put up. Um, there's been a huge number of them put up, uh, as you know, just off the coast here. And um, you, you, get, you get lots of steady in the UK, lots of steady generation from them. It's very unusual to have no wind everywhere in the UK at once. Um, if, um, if they ask questions about um, wind turbines, the big downside of wind turbines, you guys love saying they look ugly. Uh, it's very key stage two. But if we, we talk about the real downside, they are un. They're not always reliable, so they're, they're pretty good, but they're, they're not perfect. 
the big issue with them is that they take up a huge amount of space. The The size of that wind farm out there is absolutely massive. If you ever get the chance to go out there and have a look, it's incredible. Um, but they're, they're not very um, – you can't um, – I've lost it. This happens when someone texts you, right? So they're really far apart. They don't generate very much um, electricity for the area that they're built in. So um, one of the questions a few years ago was comparing wind farms with nuclear power stations. Nuclear power stations are great because they don't produce uh, carbon dioxide when they're running, or very little at least. And you can pack in a huge amount of generation. You can get a lot of power out of them for a really small space. So there's some positives to nuclear power as well. But with that, we've got some downsides to nuclear power. Uh, at the moment, we don't have a real long-term solution for the waste that they generate. And um, there, there's other things like critical incidents at nuclear power stations are, are pretty nasty when they occur, although they are incredibly rare. Coal power stations, we're moving away from coal in the UK now. Most of the world is, in fact, closing coal power stations. The Germans, I think, are going to close all of theirs within a couple of years. And that's because they produce huge amounts of carbon dioxide for the electricity they generate. So carbon dioxide, you'll get this question quite possibly. Uh, carbon dioxide is, traps infrared uh, radiation from the sun, warming the planet. Um, it's called the greenhouse effect. We need a little bit, don't get me wrong. So some greenhouse effect is great because it keeps the, the earth slightly warm. The problem is as we increase the amount of carbon dioxide, we are increasing the warming effect and that's starting to create dangerous conditions um, for, the, for the state of the earth as it is at the moment. That's called climate change. It's really important that you're aware that climate change is different to weather. Weather is what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, uh, in case you've forgotten, june and it's about 12 degrees outside and at the same time february we saw some days that were about 15 16 degrees so that's weather versus climate be careful with mixing those two up if you give an extended answer the hardline facts as far as the exam board are concerned and that's what really matters for tomorrow morning is that any carbon dioxide released has the uh, negative impact on climate change okay so watch out for that Anything you can do to reduce your electricity bill, anything that you can do to, to reduce your uh, usage of energy will uh, benefit the environment because there'll be less carbon dioxide emitted. OK, so watch out for that sort of question. Uh, you guys are pretty good at answering those. We've, we've seen in the past on exams some, some nice questions and some good answers. Um, I'm trying to think that's, that's pretty much it. Um, efficiency uh, quite often comes up when we're talking about power stations. If you're um given a question on this there'll be lots of information within the the text of the question and what you'll need to do is choose the energy input and the energy output and it's it's a simplish calculation there's an equation on page two you use the useful and you divide it by the total and then you times that by 100 and it'll give you a percentage most power stations are somewhere between 30 and 50 percent efficient they're they're not great most of them okay right so uh, let's have a look at some of the questions that have popped in. So uh, while we're here, we'll, we'll talk. Um, yeah, let's do the wind turbine and the transformer. Uh, so inside, this is for triple award in particular now. So inside each of those wind turbines, you have a generator. Now, generators work by spinning a magnet inside a coil of wire. As the magnet spins, uh, the... Uh, magnetic field lines cut through the wires and that moves the electrons creating a current. It creates an alternating current because the magnet has a north and a south pole and as they flip round you're getting a different current produced uh, each time. They are spinning at roughly 50 times per second, it's 50 hertz in the UK. Um, so each of those would have um, a transformer and a gear set up that, that converted the electricity being produced to match that of the national grid. Um, a couple of people asked me to go over motors and generators. So motors and generators are the opposite of each other. So um, if you were to take your hairdryer, that's got um, an electric motor in it designed to blow air out of the, uh, of the, the end so you can dry your hair. So if you put electricity in, it spins the motor because Fleming's left hand, I get a force from a field 
when I have a current as well. So there's this three-sided sort of gang symbol one of the students said to me today. So the force represents your, or your thumb represents the force or the motion. First finger for field, this is Fleming's left hand. And then the second finger for current. So you might have to, to find yourself doing this sort of weird thing where you sort of line something up on the, the paper, uh, matching the magnetic fields and things like that. Okay, so, so keep an eye out for that. They're relatively straightforward because the answer will probably be up, down, left or right. And you just have to work out which one. Okay, if one of the fields is going to the left, then, then the only answer really that you're going to have left is, is up or down. Okay, so just, just keep an eye out for that. Um, I mean, it could be out, but it's unlikely to be. Okay, so generators are exactly the opposite. So if you take your hairdryer, electricity goes in, blows air out. Now, if you were to, to disconnect it, don't try this just in case you electrocute your cells. At least wait until after your exam before you do that. Um, if you were to blow into your hairdryer, it would spin the motor of the hairdryer the wrong way around, right? And now you've got a moving magnet inside a coil rather than having electricity going in to move a, a magnet inside the coil, right? So you have completely the opposite. So in theory, electricity should come out of your hairdryer if you were to blow in to the end of it. Never tried it, I'll be honest. <clears throat> okay, yeah, we'll do some domestic electricity in the ring main in a bit. Um, just have a look at what else we've got on the, on the list here. Uh, to work out power, is it work done divided by time? Yes, Jack. Power is uh, the rate at which energy is transferred. If you have uh, an amount of energy, so um, I don't know, so the amount of uh, heat energy being transferred by a kettle, for example, the amount of time it's transferring it for, the power will be the amount of energy divided by the time. Okay. Um, Sankey diagrams. Yeah, we'll do a Sankey diagram. We'll go back. We'll, we'll talk for a second about um, power stations again, okay? So Sankey diagrams are horrible to draw to scale, so you won't have to draw one. But you might, you might have to fill theirs in, if you know what I mean. So this is a Sankey diagram. Look how wonderful it is, okay? It's one of my best. The size of this arrow at the beginning here matches the size of this arrow and this arrow here, apparently, uh, if you draw them right. So if this is, say, uh, like 1,000 joules, so for a power station, maybe a 1,000 joules of energy go in here. And then coming out, useful energy, maybe 600 joules of electrical energy comes out here. So that means that... 400 joules are wasted. So this is my waste energy down here. Um, it's very quick to do an efficiency calculation because if I do the total in, sorry, the useful out divided by the total in, it's going to give me 600 divided by 1,000, and that's going to be 60%. Okay? So energy in, useful out, waste energy at the bottom. Okay? This should be the same size as this and this added together, okay? Can I go over physics? Well, I am kind of trying to go over physics. Um, so that's the Sankey diagram. Uh, you, you won't get that much on a Sankey diagram, I don't think, because they're not worth the time. You won't have to draw one. So they, they couldn't give you enough marks to justify the time that it would take you to draw a Sankey diagram. You're just going to have to put some numbers on, or maybe you'll have to read off a Sankey diagram that you've been given. Um, right, so let's have a look. Um, right, so we'll do just do a quick... Um, where am I? Uh, we'll just do a quick flick through the circuit diagram. that We've only seen this now twice. But we'll just run through it again in case there's anything extra we can jog in your memories. So this is the standard circuit that I think you guys are going to get. So here we've got an ammeter, a voltmeter. We've got uh, some components. So it's a bulb in this case. We've got a variable resistor, so I can change the resistance of the circuit. That will allow me to vary the, ammy, uh, the ammeter reading and vary the voltmeter reading as well. This is a battery. The battery's got two cells in it in this particular example. Other famous characters are the thermistor, the diode. Um, that, that's 
basically the set of symbols that you're going to get. Now, I had a, a question a moment ago asking if I look at um, the branching of current in different uh, circuits, uh, in parallel circuits. Let me just find um, sheet paper to do it on. Wow, we've done loads, actually, guys. I've got like 20 sheets here. Okay, here we go. So uh, if we've got a parallel circuit, it means there are two ways for the current to go. Now, the thing I've told loads of you in class is that there are some TV series that you have to watch one after the other. Okay, you can't start Pretty Little Liars at season four, right? I've tried it, guys. It just doesn't work. You've got to watch the first one first. Series components come one after the other. You've got to watch them in time. And then we've got the opposite. So parallel. There's some TV shows. I mean, I used to watch a lot of Family Guy. It doesn't matter when you watch Family Guy. You can watch any episode, basically, one after the other or, or next to each other. And you can jump seasons. It's not a problem because... The, the, the jokes kind of stay the same. There's, you can watch them side by side. So side by side, parallel. There's two routes. Imagine train tracks. They're parallel to each other, okay? And this particular example here, we've got two resistors in parallel. Now, I think it was Grace that asked, can I go over what would happen? So if these resistors are the same as each other, the same amount of current will flow through both of them, meaning that... If I put an ammeter, I don't know, let's check one in here. So if I have an ammeter here, it, I don't know what it'll read. Maybe let's say 10. That's a nice number. If the ammeter here reads 10, I know that half of the current is going through this one and half of the current is going through this one because they're the same as each other. I always know that the current here is the same as both of these are together. So if the current through this one, maybe you've done a question and it's asked you to calculate the current through uh, resistor one using the equation on page two, and you found it, and then it says uh, the current through resistor two is six. What's the resistor over here? Sorry, what's the ammeter over here going to read? You just need to know that you add these two together and you get the current through here, okay? So... Um, think of it as, as a like a dual carriageway. If you've got two lanes of traffic, there's two ways for the traffic to go. But here, where I've only got one, it's got to come back together again. So the current here will be higher than in these two here. In fact, will be the double if they're the same. Okay, so that's parallel uh, components. I don't like parallel circuits, but that's parallel components. Okay, a um, couple of questions coming in. Um, we will run through really quickly uh, the radiation, because there's a question before it disappears off the top of the chat bar. Um, so the electromagnetic radiation spectrum, spectrum of EM radiation, seven of them, lowest energy, highest energy. You can write them the other way around. It doesn't matter what order they're in, just you have to turn your label upside down. So radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays. I've flagged these, remember, as the important three down here because these three are higher or are high energy and their energy is enough that they can cause ionization. Ionization can lead to cancer, okay? So watch out for them down there. I did a little bit more talking about those the other day. EM radiation is a transverse wave, in case that comes up. Transverse waves are um, where the oscillations, so whether the vibration bit, the up and downy bit, is at right angles to the direction of travel. So if the wave was moving across the screen this way, then the, the oscillations will be going up and down. Don't forget there's longitudinal waves as well. Longitudinal waves move sort of forward and backwards. Um, if the energy is moving across the screen, you'd see them doing like this shuffle like this. Okay, so longitudinal um, are along the direction transverse or across it. Okay, so keep an eye out for those as well. Uh, other things that come up in um, the topic uh, EM radiation is communication. And part of communication is satellites. And satellites communicate with Earth via microwaves. Microwaves travel very nicely through the at Earth's atmosphere, so we can talk to space with them. Um, so if I want to, to uh, have a telephone conversation with someone in Australia, for example, I could use a satellite phone. So the phone that I, I use 
will talk to a satellite above us somewhere. That satellite will then beam the signal back to Earth to a base station. That will beam it to another satellite, back to a base station, maybe again. But eventually, it will beam down from a satellite somewhere to Australia. Okay, And sort of bounce backwards and forwards between satellites and base stations until they've reached the destination they get to. Okay, Your mobile phone doesn't use a satellite. Your mobile phone uses local phone masts, and it bounces signals backwards and forwards off mobile phone masts. That's why when you go out into the mountains and you're not near a mast, you don't have any signal. Um, you can use your mobile phone to call someone in Australia, though. And what's happening there is your phone is talking to the mast. The mast is talking to a big dish. The dish is talking to a satellite and so on and so on, right? So you, you can make a connection, but it's not how you, you know, like Snapchat, your mate has got nothing to do with a satellite above your head or anything, okay? Right, so um, I'm just going to run through um, energy transfers next. I, I promise to do a, a bit of a bigger session on this bit. So there's three energy transfers that you guys need to be aware of. Conduction, convection, and radiation. Conduction happens best in solids. Um, in non-metals, the particles vibrate, right? So they wiggle backwards and forwards. You've seen like the Malteser diagrams we draw in science. As those particles vibrate backwards and forwards, they collide with each other and they sort of all start to wiggle around, a bit like uh, penguins. Imagine all penguins sort of pushed in. If one of them started moving around, it would sort of knock into the other little penguins and it'll fall over. If you're talking metals, metals will do that, the wiggling, but they do something else as well. Metals have free moving electrons or delocalized electrons. You can use either phrase. The delocalized electrons are free to move through the metal and they, they're very good at, at carrying energy around. So if you heat one end of a metal bar, the electrons that are free to move through it will carry the energy to the other end of the bar very quickly. That's why metals are such great conductors, because of those electrons. So if you have uh, a fluid, now a fluid is either a gas or a liquid, um, the particles are free to move around each other. So if I heat like, the, the bottom corner of a beaker with, with some water in, the particles there will gain energy and they will, the volume, the, the, the bit they're in, will expand a bit because all those particles are jiggling around a little bit more, taking up a bit more space, they're moving around. So they'll sort of force their way out a bit. And that makes them less dense, so they'll rise upwards. But as they rise up, over here, the cooler stuff will sink to take its place. So you've got some going like this and some going like this. So you get this kind of like this sort of circling effect called the convection current. Okay. Um, fluids can do convection. Solids can't do convection because they're not able to move. If um, the last one is radiation. So radiation is, the, is genuinely just energy on the move on its own. So all objects that are warm emit radiation. Uh, it's usually for us in the infrared uh, region. Uh, it means that we can use thermal imaging cameras because we can see the radiation coming off. There's uh, nothing, well, there's a couple of things that you can do to increase the um, emission of infrared. Objects that are hotter emit infrared faster. Objects that are black and matte, so that's not shiny, so dull black objects will emit radiation faster. But at the same time, black dull objects will absorb radiation faster as well. So they give it away quick and they take it in quick as well. Shiny and silver are the opposite. So shiny and silver doesn't really release very quickly at all. If you're trying to keep something warm, you wrap it in silver foil, right? But at the same time, they also don't absorb it very well either. So they'll keep something cool at the same time. Um, yes, convection would cool something down. So if I have a, a hot object, then the, there you go, got a cup of tea, tan for this. The rising um, hot air from here would carry away energy, cooling down my tea. So if I want to keep my tea warm for longer, then you put a lid on it, right? Lid on your tea, the warm air will find it harder to rise off the tea, and that means it will stay warm for just that little bit longer, okay? Um, so what's this got to do with uh, you and your homes, right? That's the important bit. So insulation keeps your home warm. It keeps you warm. You have um, clothes, I hope, on at the moment, and you're trapping air in the layers of your clothes. It's a cold day today. I'm wearing a couple of layers. 
and that's trapping warm air. If I trap air, air is a really bad conductor because the particles are spread apart. If um, air, though, can do convection, which we just talked about. But if I trap it by like uh, wool fibers, cotton fibers, it stops the air being free to move. That traps uh, that warm air, preventing it from spiraling up into a convection current. Um, there's not much I can do to, to reduce radiation. If maybe I, I thought I was in danger of, of getting hypothermia or something, I might like get one of those shiny silver blankets. If you've seen people who've just done like um, marathons, half marathons, big long runs, stuff like that, you might see them at the end of that being given a silver spe space blanket and they wrap themselves in a silver foil blanket. That reduces their radiation. It traps air around them and it, it looks cool, I guess, as well. So we can reduce energy transfer. We can never stop it. Please don't write that in your exam. If you say it stops energy transfer, it's like, ah, because you can't really stop it. You can slow it down, reduce it. Um, try not to say stops. It's the sort of thing that we put big crosses next to on mark schemes. So, so stay away from that phrase. It's the same. It's the same answer every time. So double glazing works the same way as loft insulation, the same way as I just described with the fibers of my clothes. We are um, reducing convection by trapping the air. We're reducing conduction by having air in the, in the way in the first place. And we are reducing radiation with a reflective coating or, or maybe a, a silvered surface, something like that on it. Okay. Um, right. Okay. Um, where are we going? Uh, so if I was to, uh, the dog's about to start barking because uh, Mrs. Wilkins is about to come in. Um, if I was to to buy some, I don't know, some really nice new um, double glazing for my house, I would um, have to pay for it, right? So maybe I will spend £2,000 on some brand new double glazing. But the great thing about some new double glazing is every year I'm going to save, I don't know, maybe £200 on my heating bill. So instead of spending that money, I'm going to get back £200. If I want to know whether it's worth getting that double glazing, I should think about the payback time that um, that it will take. So how long will it take to get my money back? Now, £2,000, and I'm saving £200 a year. It's nice, easy maths. I divide the 2000 by two uh, 200 and that's going to give me 10 years. Okay? So... So if um, yeah, if you're asked to calculate the payback time of something, it's the amount it costs you divided by the amount it's going to save you for the, the time period they're talking about. Watch out. One of their favorite questions is, what would happen to the payback time if, and then they'll describe something, or they might ask you to, to describe uh, what could affect the payback time. The only thing that affects payback time is a change in the in the saving okay so if the if you can think of a situation that changes the saving so energy prices going up means that i will save more money than i would have done otherwise so my payback time will come down you sometimes get this in relation to um solar panels as well solar panels have a really long payback time um so no one would really put them on their roof by choice and and sometimes they ask interesting exam questions to do with this um right okay so you guys are making this really hard for me by chattering away on the side here uh yes that's what we went over marin before the lesson um i think that's everything you guys have shouted up about in there um keep an eye out um yeah um for a total cost or something like that while we're on the Domestic electricity. Someone asked me to do domestic electricity earlier on today, so we'll just find um, somewhere to draw a diagram. Right, we'll reuse this one. So the ring main is the, the thing that upsets you guys from domestic electricity bit because it looks crazy and really complicated. Uh, it's actually really simple. It's um, how all of our houses are wired pretty much. And it's a loop of wire, okay, like this. And then you've got these things, I think they're called tails. So this is my connection to the national grid outside my house. This is something called my consumer unit. Uh, some people um, have that combined with some sort of circuit breakers uh, or fuse box. And then I've got three wires. I've got a live wire, I've got an earth wire, and I've got a neutral wire. 
The live wire carries the energy to the plug sockets. They're those things that you plug your iPhone charger into. Okay, so we've got sockets and they've got a live and earth and a neutral pin in each of those. And these sockets, um, you'll notice that I can go this way around to get to the socket or I can go that way around to get to the socket. So there's two paths. And if you remember, we were talking earlier about um, um, current flowing uh, around through circuits. Um, if I've got two routes, then I can reduce the current in any one of those routes. So the current will be half because it's got two ways to go. And that's quite uh, useful because it means I get less resistance in the wires. So there's less chance of me setting my house on fire. It means that there's um, I can use less copper wire. It, it sounds a bit strange. I'd have to use really thick copper wire if uh, I wanted to avoid it getting too hot. So I have two routes, and that means that I can have thinner wires. Thinner wires means it's more bendable, which means I can then get it around the house a little bit easier. It's a bit easier for people to install. Okay. Um, the circuit breakers, um, now they're very clever. So what a circuit breaker does is it detects a difference between the, um, the live and the earth. And if something... The, I'm trying to remember exactly what the phrase in the exam board uses, but it, it detects when current is escaping from the loop. If it notices a difference between the, the input and the output, then it will cut the circuit to your house. And that's why sometimes maybe if um, you're using the electric shower upstairs and someone turns on a heater somewhere else, it might trip out everything in your house. And it's because it's noticed a leaking or an over an overpulling of current through the system. If you um, have old school fuses, old school fuses have thin pieces of wire in them. If too much current travels through that thin piece of wire, the wire will melt, that will break the circuit, that stops you from electrocuting yourself. Basically, that and the stuff that we've talked about previously, I think yesterday we did quite a lot on the domestic stuff, so go and have a look at that if you've got any extra questions. The, where are the circuit breakers? They are as the electricity comes into your home, so they're over here, Marin, okay? Right. Um, what's payback time, Jack? Well, I, I tried to do that, so have another look back at that, if that's okay. It's the time it takes, though, for you to get back the money that you spent buying the thing. So really simple example. Um, I'm saving £100 a month on petrol because I ride a bicycle to school, but it costs me £1,000 for my bicycle. In 10 months, I'll have back the £1,000 by saving the petrol. Okay, so that's that's payback time with a really simple example. Um, we'll do a quick earthquakes because that looks like people really, really want earthquakes. Um, what's the best way to remember the radio waves and stuff? I don't know. You can make yourself a quick mnemonic. So write them out in order and then make yourself like a little rhyme, a bit like Richard of York gave battle in vain for remembering the colors. Uh, that could be one thing that you try. Um, um, I don't know. Right. Uh, let me just draw a diagram for this. Right. So if I've got an earthquake, I'll tell you what, we'll do this bit again from the other day. Oh, do you know what? I'm looking forward to throwing all of this lot away tomorrow afternoon. The length of the mantle or crust. Hmm. Right, so this is a seismometer trace. You see how we've got a disturbance here where the P wave arrives. This is triple, so take a break if you're a double student. This is the secondary wave because it arrives second. There's a lag time, a difference in time between these two. We know an awful lot about rock. We know how fast earthquakes travel through them. So if we know the lag time, we can work out how far away from station A the earthquake epicenter, where it happened, actually was. Okay, so as you can see, earthquake B here is a much larger lag time. It must have been further away from B. So if I've got... some stations. So here is um, station A. Here is station B. Okay, so there's two places that this earthquake could have been, right? So I need a third station down here. 
Okay, so you see how this one only crosses one of these points. So this is the epicenter of my earthquake. You might need um, a compass. Uh, I think there's one in the exam pack that you're given. Um, you might need uh, to draw them on, so they might give you a scale and they might add you, ask you to add in one of the circles to find where the epicenter point is, okay? So that's that's how you'd find the epicenter. Um, to go back to one of the little questions about <coughs> uh, learning about the inside of the Earth, because the P waves will travel um, through the solid crust but uh, and through the liquid mantle, they will travel in an, in an interesting sort of curving pattern through the Earth. The secondary waves, the, the sideways ones, the transverse ones, they won't travel through the liquid. So we get shadow zones, and the patterns of the shadow zones will allow us to work out like the depth of the crust and things like that. We can use uh, nuclear explosions. Uh, we can use earthquakes in order to, to listen, basically, to the way that the Earth rings. It's one of the things that we're doing uh, on Mars at the moment to try and, and work out whether there's any liquid left in the middle of that particular planet. So we, we can use earthquakes because of the way these P and S waves travel through the rocks. We can use those to work out what's on the inside of them. Okay, right. I'm going to do, um, yeah, one last thing. Uh, to, uh, reflection and refraction of waves, please, if you have time. Um, I did uh, a little bit more. Um, on reflection, uh, but I'll do it nice and quickly for you. I think that was in, in video one, if you want to go and look that one up. Uh, here we go. So, refraction happens because as light travels into this glass block, it slows down. And if you uh, are driving your 4x4 or whatever, as you drive it onto something um, soft like sand, it will slow the wheel. The first wheel to touch, it will slow down. So the car will make like a twisting motion. And that's the same for the light as well. So as it, as it goes in, it gets a kick. It gets a little bit of a twist. Uh, the diagram will probably be drawn for you. You might be asked to complete maybe with this refracted ray. But we've got a 90 degree line called the normal. So that's at 90 degrees to the surface. And we measure our angles from this 90 degree line. Um, it looks more complicated than the whole thing really is. It's just to make the maths, if I'm honest, a little bit simpler. Okay. Right. I am uh, particularly aware that, that most of you guys need to head off and watch Love Island. Um, I think that's like over really important. So it's more important perhaps than, than some of your physics revision. So if you've had enough physics for tonight, um, yeah, go and enjoy Love Island. So, uh, any questions? I will try and answer them tomorrow morning. I'll probably be in school from about sort of quarter past eight. Come and find me if you want me. Um, any like last minute things you want me to go over in assembly? Uh, chuck them in the in the comments here or comment on the video later on, and I'll make sure that they go into my presentation for tomorrow morning if I think we get enough stuff. Okay, right. Wow, a lot of hate for uh, Love Island there and uh, a lot of love for physics, which is nice. Thanks. It's been great talking to you all tonight. And I will, um, what time is the exam? The exam, I think, is like a nine o'clock start or whatever it is. It's, it's straight away, first thing in the morning. Okay. Um, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a lovely evening.